Good morning everybody, this is the presentation that was given in the clubhouse on Friday the 22nd of February. Obviously we can appreciate that everybody can't make the dates that uh, sometimes we put presentations on at, so that's why the reason we've done a webinar of this presentation uh, is to talk you through the slides uh, and talk you through some of the stuff we talked about that night. So the title of the presentation was a phrase transformation on course architecture. Uh, and adapting to ever-changing times. So this was uh, predominantly about some of the course architecture we're looking to put in in place prior to the start of the season uh, and some of the exciting developments we've got going on at the moment. So the slide we started with was this one here and what we did was we asked for a show of hands in the room for all the non-smokers to put their hands up. And why this wasn't a presentation on lifestyle choices or health, what we asked is for those non-smokers to give this article a quick read, or certainly read the title, which was a new vitamin cigarette that would add years to your life. We followed up with the question, having read that article, how many of you would change your opinion on smoking and perhaps take up smoking yourselves? And from the room there was a resounding no to that. And the reason there was a resounding no was quite clear really that this was an example or an article of fake news. And, and fake news is something that we hear a lot about in the modern world uh, and a lot about in the media currently. Uh, the picture in the bottom right is uh, of a clock and it's of the doomsday clock which currently sits at two minutes to midnight. And the reason it sits at two minutes to midnight is uh, largely down to the fact of the amount of fake news that is prevalent within our world today uh, in our media. And fake news is something that affects the globe uh, and certainly affects us within our own locality and in the United Kingdom. We asked the question at this point, do you think that panels being a part of any fake news recently? And we currently have seen that in our own golfing locality throughout North Yorkshire is that we are quite hotly talked about at the minute. And there's a lot of rumours circulating about things that we're doing uh, currently and things that we're looking to do uh, in the future. What we try to say is try and take everything you hear with a pinch of salt. Uh, everything that comes out of the club and you hear from the club is the genuine truth. Uh, and what you're hearing uh, around the county at the moment uh, is a little bit fictitious uh, and certainly a little bit scaremongering in places. So just try and take this with a pinch of salt. Try and err on the side of caution about what you hear uh, and listen to the things that are coming out of the club. Some of that stuff we'll tidy up now uh, in through the presentation. So moving on then from the panel being ever present in the fake news world at the moment, this was what was on the menu for the night. We always believe it's good to start healthily and start with your greens. So we started with a tree update and talked about where we were with the tree management. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that going forward. We then had a wonderful fish course of adaptive thinking and that was to do with models that we're using currently uh, at committee level uh, to try and think our way around problems uh, and trying to plan better for the future. We had an absolutely beautiful main of course architecture uh, and then a beautiful dessert detailing how some of that course architecture was going to take place, how, what, how that was shaping up prior to the start of the season and I'll talk you through that. And then for anybody who's been unfortunate enough to sample some of my cooking before, you'll know that it generally ends quite badly and generally ends in a bit of disease. So that's how we finished and then on a bit of disease uh, and this time talking a little bit about microdochium, legislation moving forward and how we're going to have to adapt to ever changing times with regard to disease management. So first things first, tree management, and I think that's a, a good place to start, just an update on where we are with that and how we are going forward. Uh, contractor tree removal, as you're well aware, has now finished uh, for phase one of the project. Phase two looking like we'll probably start in September of this year, but the phase one contractor tree removal has now finished. 80% uh, of that timber has been removed. We've still got about 20% lying about. Uh, that the contractor will come and dispose of at a later date. Uh, we've always got members picking away at it as well, uh, which you're more than welcome to if you want it. 
Stump grinding 98% complete. We say 98% because we've had a stump grinder in this week. Just tidying up a couple of outstanding areas, mainly between the 9th and the 10th, where we have that wasteland area. And we're just trying to grind the stumps out of that so that we can get a mulcher in there, take that back to bare earth and get some seed through there finally. Uh, brush 80% clear. Uh, we say 80%. Uh, that just fluctuates on a day to day basis depending on which way the wind's blowing really. Uh, obviously we've done quite a lot of tree management and we've thinned out a lot of areas so we've exposed trees now to airflow that they haven't had before. And what tends to happen is when we have strong winds uh, those branches, those lower branches start blowing off. And it's just really the tree cleaning itself up so it's got a nice high canopy uh, and they look a lot better for that. So that fluctuates depending on the wind. What was noticeable Obviously in the last wind you'll notice uh, about two weeks ago we had a storm roll through uh, and in the areas where we've done woodland management we had no fallers. We only had two fallers on the site and they were behind the 8th green where we've done no woodland management which I think shows uh, the positive aspect of doing woodland management and making your tree stock safe uh, and highlighting these areas. Uh, bark chip 75%. Uh, this is the most tedious part of the project as you can well imagine is lifting bark mulch necessity really to get the grass to grow underneath uh, and to get the bark chip out of the holes otherwise it just decomposes and it just sinks uh, this is really back breaking stuff and I cannot thank the boys enough for this during this phase not a pleasant phase hence the reason we've done no volunteer events during this phase as we actually want people to come back uh, and this is not the sort of work that you would come back for so 75% uh, really tedious work uh, and we're ongoing with that. Uh, holes fill 25%. It uh, doesn't seem a lot but once we get into the hole filling we'll kind of rattle through that. Uh, the soiling of holes uh, is a lot quicker than the bark chip removal. Uh, so we'll start to rattle through that in the next few weeks. Uh, get some seed in there and get those areas germinated as the soil temperatures continue to rise. So looking forward really, uh, as I say we've been stump grinding the 10th this week uh, with the stump grinder, uh, bark removal and hole reinstatement, so we're ongoing with that uh, and the hole reinstatement should be a lot quicker than the bark removal. Uh, mulcher, we've got a mulcher coming in, uh, that is commencing on the 11th of March and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in the next slide. And we've also going to do some power harrowing and seeding, so once that mulcher's in and we've taken that back to a bare earth, we'll get all those areas uh, power harrowed. Uh, get them seeded with some tall fescue and get them grown up. So I said I would talk to you a little bit about mulching. Uh, the picture there is a, a mulcher and that's the mulcher that we're planning to use. It's a bit of a beast of a mulcher as you can see. Uh, a very very productive machine and we're planning to have that in for a couple of days to get through the areas that we want to get mulched. So those areas really are behind the first, uh, between 9 and 10, a couple of areas up the side of the 8th, uh, one at the side of the 9th, uh, and maybe a little bit between 5 and 17 as well. And what this mulcher does is it goes in there and churns out all the tree roots. So obviously in areas where we've had woodland we've got tree root, and we want to be able to get back down to bare earth so we can seed these areas with tall fescue and get some nice grasses growing. So to do that we have to mulch out these areas, and that's what this machine does. Highly productive machine, very very fast and efficient at doing the job and that's going to give us a nice uh, bare seed pan that we can go back to and certainly help tidy up massively areas like between 9 and 10 which we did a couple of winters ago uh, and it's just been lying as dead ground. We really want to make a highlight of that, get some seed growing through there, get some lovely tall fescue going through there and a little bit of wild flower uh, and this is the machine that's going to help us to do that. Looking to commence that really week commencing the 11th of March uh, given the right weather condition. Uh, quite a heavy machine so quite heavy to track around uh, so we need to make sure the weather is right to do that but that's looking like the 11th of March and once that's done that will tidy up those areas, take them back to bare earth as I say uh, and we'll get some nice grasses growing through there. So that really tidies up the tree management update, that's where we're at currently uh, making decent progress uh, and the weather is helping with that. So that's where we are with tree management really, um, 
like I said, the, the bulky stuff now is really out of the way. It's just a case of filling holes and getting that mulcher in uh, so that we can get those uh, areas that are a little unsightly tidied up uh, and get some nice tall grass growing through there and really see uh, the benefit of doing woodland management. But just moving on from that, we started then to talk about uh, an adaptive thinking model. Uh, the gentleman at the bottom there is a gentleman called Jeff Boss, who was a former Navy SEAL, and he wrote this book, Navigating Chaos, How to Find Certainty in Uncertain Situations, which I think is the perfect way to describe panel at some stages, uh, and it's certainly a book that I've uh, spent quite a bit of time looking at. And within that, he talks about uh, three things that adaptive thinkers need. And the reason I brought this in is this is how our Greens Committee try to think in our committees now uh, is using this adaptive thinking model. So why uh, a lot of people may just think that we get together uh, and we just block at straws. We do have a thinking model that we use uh, to try and come up with the best decision. Our canvas is an ever changing one, as you well know. Our situation is an ever changing one. So the ability to adapt on site is absolutely paramount to us going forward. So the three things that we looked at are impulse control, so looking before you leap. So any situation that we come into, making sure that we plan it, making sure that we don't just make rash decisions and decisions are made um, in the firm interests of the club and our membership and the firm interests of taking the golf course on. Uh, this is very much uh, an onward movement. Uh, we've talked about stripping back the canvas, but the idea is to move forward. But to do that, you have to be uh, rational in your behaviours. So impulse control is important. Leaving ego at the door. Our Greens Committee now is quite a diverse one. Uh, we just brought Laura in from, uh, from the office uh, onto our Greens team as well. As well as Dave Padgett, myself, uh, James Barker. Uh, John Mountford, uh, our Greens Chairman, John Clayton, our Chairman, and Jonathan Conway, our Deputy Head Greenkeeper. So all of us leave our egos at the door because what we are trying to do is we're trying to think of new ways uh, of doing old tasks. Uh, so trying to think of new ways uh, around problems and trying to think of positive ways of moving forward. And the one thing that we all share in common is this curiosity. So we're a, we're a very curious bunch. We're always trying to look at uh, a new way of thinking of things, uh, searching out solutions, uh, even when there doesn't look like there's one. So trying to, our best uh, to think around the problems that we have, uh, think around some of the issues that we encounter along the way, whether that be during tree management uh, or golf course architecture. So that's our adip adaptive thinking model. And I thought that was useful to bring in at that stage, just to kind of get you to understand is how about we go about uh, making decisions regarding the golf course. So one such area where we've obviously had to adaptively think over the past few months is that in the architecture of the golf course. And certainly from the start we talked about tree management being the, uh, the start of creating the canvas, so blanking the canvas. And since we've done that, we've definitely seen the need that we need architecture in places. And that is needs to be sped up quicker than we originally thought. So that needs to be actioned quicker than we originally thought if the actual general strategy of the golf course isn't to be affected. So I'm just going to talk you now through the beneficial architecture uh, and how we went about putting some of that or looking to put that some of that in place. So whether it's tree management, greens maintenance, or general day-to-day -day maintenance on the golf course, every plan has a starting point, and golf course architecture is no exception. In fact, the starting point of golf course architecture is the planning phase, and the planning phase of a golf course architecture project is certainly the most important. So where did we start with that? Well, obviously, as we said, we cleared the canvas. So phase one tree management was a massive part of that. That allowed us to see what we class as these development areas. So areas where we were taking the back golf course back from a penal design and uh, using trees as hazards to a strategic heroic design using course architecture as hazards. We could see where there was poorly placed architecture now that we'd removed the trees. Examples being fairway bunkering up the second, for example. So we saw opportunities here uh, for areas that we could reconstruct. 
we then had to say, do we have the budget in place? How well has the club done uh, through 2018? Has that given us the flexibility to do more in 2019 when it comes to beneficial architecture? Unfortunately, we've done very well in 2018 uh, from a budgetary point of view, and that has given us some freedom to do some things. We then had to look at the time scales. Obviously, we were using golf course contractors here. Some of them are moving on to their sports ground work, i.e. in the football pitches and the rugby pitches uh, over the coming months. Uh, and that is a shift from what they've been doing over the winter, which is predominantly golf courses. So we had to say, can we get these people in? Is there availability there? And can we get done what we want to get done prior to the start of our own golfing season? We then had to look as, do we have the architect in place? And I think we spoke about this in the prior presentation, our use of Ken Moody. Uh, Ken's a great advocate of simple golf course design, simple but effective, and has done some good work over at Moortown uh, and also at Linderick. Uh, and Ken's on board, and Ken is uh, intrinsic to our plans moving forward. So as we said, the key to this is to plan, plan, plan. Planning is the key uh, to golf course architecture and to making a project happen. So we had to decide things like, what are we going to do? Where's, where's necessity that we do first? Who are we going to use? When can we get started? Do we have that finance in place? How well has the year before gone? Uh, what is the ultimate goal? What are we looking to achieve from this? Uh, can we construct it in the time scale? Do we have the plan? So we've just gone through things like land surveying, uh, topography surveys to get all these uh, architecture in the right place. Do we have the quantity estimates? So then going through all our materials, working out what we're going to need so that we can budget for this. Going through the scale drawings. So Ken Moody's put together some scale drawings, which I'll show you in the coming slides. Is the material available? So for example, when we look at turf, we're going to be using a lot of turf during this project phase. Uh, last year wasn't a great year for turf growers. We all know how quite dry it was during the summer uh, and that's not great for growing turf. So is there, a, is there a field there available that we can use um, going forward? Unfortunately, there is of good quality turf. We've then gone to the committee and the committee have given us their go ahead to get on with this. We're then presenting this to you now uh, through member information. So we did that obviously on the Friday the 22nd uh, and we're doing this now via web webinar. We had to look at our golfing schedule. So there was, there was uh, certainly uh, some golf fixtures that we're going to have to work around in the coming weeks, but we can do that. And then the construction that happens itself. So a lot going into it prior to actually digging any holes in the ground. Uh, so a lot of work had to go in to get us to this point. So a crucial question coming at this phase and that is, where do we see the areas of necessity? Yes, we don't have the budget, we don't have the time to do every bunker on the golf course within the space of a few months. Nobody has ever done that anywhere. But where are our real areas of necessity on the front nine uh, on during phase one that are going to make a difference going forward? Um, and we see that as three holes in particular, uh, holes number two, four and eight. Uh, and across that we're looking at about seven bunkers across three holes. That's five additions and two reconstructions. So seven bunkers across three holes. So in the following uh, diagrams, you'll see what seven bunkers across three holes looks like. Uh, so on the left, you've got a Google Earth image uh, that is being planned with new bunkering in. Uh, and on the right, you have the plans of a topography survey that gives you the dimensions of the bunkers uh, and also the landfall roundabout looking for high points so that the bunkers sit well within, uh, within the topography of the site. Uh, so this is obviously hole number two. Uh, you'll see down the left, uh, some of these Google Earth images are a little old. Uh, Google Earth hasn't updated recently, so we still have tree line in places that we don't have currently. Uh, so down the left, we certainly have some of those oak, but all the poplar have gone. Uh, and here you'll see uh, is uh, the introduction uh, of two new fairway bunkers, uh, one fairway bunker reconstruction and one greenside reconstruction as well. So looking at the fairway bunkers first, 
the first one on the front right that we currently have will be filled in. Uh, we kind of see that now is a little bit out of date and a little bit out of play. Uh, the second bunker on the fairway that we currently have will be reconstructed. Uh, so why it's not far from being in the right place uh, as a fairway bunker goes, it's not a great aesthetic fairway bunker. Uh, the drainage in there is uh, a little bit shot now. So that will be completely redone, uh, reconstructed, redesigned, relined, redrained, resanded. Uh, in addition to that, another fairway will go in so the aesthetic will say very similar on the on the second but the fairway bunkers will be further up so they'll be further into the gap so that that, that gap that you look from the second tee uh, up to the heathland section uh, on six you can see where we've taken out the trees by the fourth tee uh, so one of those bunkers will sit in that gap sort of break up the aesthetic of the landscape uh, and also will be right in play now for the modern day golfer uh, so that'll be uh, a little bit further pushed in towards the fairway as well. So still two bunkers down the right, just repositioned a little bit further up. And you'll also notice uh, back towards the way there's an old bunker scar on the right that is uh, from a long time ago. Uh, so that area will be softened down because we want to take the fairway more, uh, more right to left. Uh, so it, uh, enhancing the dog leg. So to do that we're going to have to soften that mound off. So two down the right. In addition to that, there'll be one down the left, which will be further down again. And this is to try and discourage people from cutting off more of the corner than the day. Uh, so the gap between the one on the left and the one on the right will look quite narrow from the tee. The reality is that there'll be still plenty of space there, uh, but aesthetically it'll look quite narrow from the tee and tighten up the landing area. Uh, and the one down the left is really a risk reward bunker, uh, where if you feel you can fly, you really are taking it on. Uh, the green side bunker, uh, a lot of the mounding around the green side looks very artificial and why it does a reasonable job of tra channeling water it also uh, has a poor knack of making people walk in the same area so we have a little bit of sheep tracking there in places. Uh, that mounding needs softening off. The green side bunker is one of the worst on the golf course. Uh, the sand's not great, we've got a lot of gravel migration, so that's a complete reconstruction. Uh, we definitely felt that if we were going to do three fairway bunkers on this hole, we had to do the green side bunker as well, and at least get a hole that we could uh, finished and out of the way and looking brilliant. Uh, so that's uh, four bunkers to get done on hole number two. Uh, moving on to the second hole of necessity, uh, which for us we felt was the fourth. Uh, everybody who's played panel will know uh, that the fourth is a relatively short par five. Um, and what we used to have, you can still see it on Google Earth there, is we used to have uh, birch uh, down on the, uh, on the corner of the apex. Uh, and that birch was a very penal hazard. And birch doesn't have a great lifespan, very much a pioneer tree. So for us, the removal of that birch was paramount, but obviously that left us a little more wide open. So we did know at that stage that we had to put some architecture in there. So what we've settled for at the moment is uh, a bunker left and a bunker right within the driving landing area. Um, the is scope to do more bunkering down the right at a later date, but for now we felt these two were uh, of the greatest necessity. The bunker down the left, uh, it will be around about 255 to 265 from the tee, and the bunker on the right will be up towards 275, 280. So the bunker on the left, right in play. Again, uh, similar to the aesthetic on the second, it will look a lot narrower than it actually is, uh, but again, that's a great aesthetic to have from the tee, and it certainly challenges you on the eye. Uh, the bunker down the left uh, flirts with the exact line that you want to be on as we know the fairway runs from left to right so anything landing on the left generally kicks at the fairway on the right but you're going to have to flirt, uh, flirt with that left fairway trap uh, and if you push that slightly too hard you're going to find the bunker down the right. Uh, so good strategic pl placement there of two bunkers and will really add to uh, a hole that is quite short but has a lot of interest up uh, from the mound section up towards the green. We're just trying to add a little more interest into the fairway section uh, and these two fairway bunkers are definitely going to do that. So that's two more fairway bunkers on four uh, to match the uh, four new bunkers on the second. Uh, 
Uh, the final bunker, the seventh bunker here, is going to be placed on the eighth. Uh, so again, this is a, an old Google Earth image, it hasn't been updated, and obviously you'll know that the tree stock but now in eight is a lot thinner than that. It's actually quite a good Google Earth image because you can actually see how dense it used to be, uh, quite worryingly dense in fact, uh, and the asset we've got up there now looks phenomenal. Uh, but what we've done there is obviously because we've pushed the tree line back, uh, we've in essence made the hole a little bit wider. We've always found the eighth to be a little bit uh, lacking in interest. Uh, so this was the idea that Ken drew up for the eighth, uh, was to possibly uh, change the nature of the hole a bit by adding a fairway bunker up the right and some mounding down the left. So again, narrowing up that landing area. Uh, what will be going in uh, prior to the start of the season is the fairway bunker down the right. Again, anybody who plays the hole will know that the ball funnels from right to left. So that is an area that you have to flirt with if you're going to get close to the green. So we want to put a conscious decision in people's mind as to whether to lay up short of that bunker and play a wedge or whether to flirt with it uh, and drive down the right hand side and really bring that bunker into play. So the bunker in down the right will be going in prior to start of the season. Uh, the mounding down the left we do feel is important as well. Uh, however, our time scales are a little bit against us. Uh, and that fill uh, for those mounds will be coming from another project on 7 which I'll talk to you about in a second uh, so that will be left till uh, till the autumn time uh, autumn winter of uh, of this year we'll get cutting with that uh, and again that will add uh, some great feature to the hole mounding is an important part here at panel unfortunately in areas the mounding hasn't been done very well uh, so some of that will need redoing but the ones that are in uh, and have been there for a long time look phenomenal uh, and we really want to play on that and add a little bit to that. So these mounds will have a mix of tall fescue on them uh, and potentially some heather planting as well. Uh, so again, they'll really add to the aesthetic of the hole. Uh, but for now, uh, they'll wait till uh, the autumn of this year. And, and for now, what we'll be doing with our contractor is putting in the bunker down the right hand side of it. So for those of you that can count, <laughs> better than myself anyway, that was the seven bunkers across three holes there. So four bunkers on the second, two on the fourth and one on the eighth. Uh, the next hole I'm showing you is hole seven. Uh, and the reason I'm showing you hole seven is why we're not doing anything with this in the spring. Uh, this will form part of the autumn winter project uh, with holes uh, seven and eight. So some of the fill that we're getting from seven will go uh, and be used on the 8th uh, for the mounding. Uh, the 7th, uh, I believe personally, is one of the best pictures that Ken drew up, uh, really improving what is quite a mundane hole at the moment, in my opinion. Uh, so to do that, what he uh, what he proposed was raising the tee slightly by about half a metre to a metre, and that was to improve the view of the landing area. We would then shift the fairway from the right uh, further towards the left, again accentuating that dog leg similar to what we did on the second and taking away some of the fairway from the back of the 15th green uh, and 16th tee. Uh, do a little bit of mounding down the right uh, close to the 16th tee and back of the 15th green uh, to again coincide with some of the ones down the left and to tighten up the landing area. Uh, the bit down the left is interesting you'll notice that hollow shape and that is a cratering effect so what we're going to do in there is strip some soil out uh, create a gully in there which will be cut as fairway height uh, take away some of the mounding on the left so down the left you'll notice uh, we've got quite a lot of mounding currently it really is very poor mounding in my personal opinion and i think a lot of people agree with that the shaping's not great of it uh, although the actual general idea was a good one, uh, the shaping and the reality of it wasn't great. So what we're proposing doing is removing the front third of those mounds and reshaping the back two thirds uh, to create a little bit more of a random effect uh, and a little bit better aesthetic. Crater out in front of the mounds. So basically if you play down the left, if you get the shot slightly wrong and you end up in that, uh, in that crater area, you'll still be on fairway, but you'll be a good way below the level of the green and it'll be a very, very tricky second shot. Uh, so the idea is just to narrow up that landing area, really adding some interest into the fairway area by moving the fairway from right to left. Up near the green you'll see uh, the front green side bunker, so currently we only have one green side bunker. One of the things that's noticeable about panel is a lot of old golf courses, majority of the bunkering tends to be at the front of the greens with very little interest to the rear and middle. 
so here what Ken's done is uh, shrunk the front size, uh, sh sorry, shrunk the, uh, sh shrunk, shrunk the front bunker uh, to two thirds of the size. Uh, and that'll be a reconstruction as well. So again, redrained, relined, etc. And he's also added another bunker into the back left. Uh, so there's a little man that sits in the back left where he's going to add another bunker, and that's just prior to the runoff that we currently have back left. So really making that uh, an interesting pin position back left uh, and a very, very tough second shot, particularly if you find yourself on the left hand side of the fairway. So that again will start in the autumn of next year. Uh, because we're going to be using some of that fill to do some mounting on it as well. So great project to run concurrently 7 and 8. Uh, so we'll probably have a little bit of cold closure during that time uh, to get to facilitate that work and to get that work done. So that was the plans of the holes that we're going to be doing over the next uh, 12 months. Uh, holes 2, 4, 7 and 8 uh, with holes 2, 4 and 8 receiving fairway bunker and prior at the start of the season. So if you look at that in detail, that's construction to commence, uh, we believe, Friday the 1st of March. And that is solely dependent on where the contractor is at. It's cur they're currently in Woburn, uh, so we'll see where they are at that stage. That is expected to take around three weeks for shaping uh, and finishing works, turfing, etc. During that time, hole closures will be in operation. We are working around golf, uh, but for example, if we ho close holes number two and three, you'll play one and then straight to the fourth. Operation is only taking place Monday to Friday, so the holes will be in play on a weekend. What I have to ask though, is it's very, very difficult, I appreciate, because we're trying to put bunkers in uh, and trying to get them in the right place, is why the turf is new and it's good quality turf that we are putting down, that's going to take time to knit in and settle. Try and stay out of these bunkers if you can. Try and avoid walking on the turf uh, as that's going to affect them and that's going to look uh, quite unsightly. The initial shaping is going to be carried out by a contractor called Fine Turf. Uh, Fine Turf, as I say, are currently busy at Woburn. Do a lot of big projects in the golf course world. Very, very good contract then. Uh, so we'll be using them for initial shaping and also using them uh, or a couple of their finishers as part of a mixed effort with our own greens team to get all the drainage installed, uh, turf down, bunkers lined and sand, etc. So at this point I thought it would be wise to talk you through um, how we construct a bunker, how these bunkers will be constructed. Uh, I think a lot of people think that you know building a bunker is digging a hole in the ground and filling it with sand. Uh, and while that generally uh, is not far from how it used to be done, uh, the reality now is a little bit different. So I thought I'd talk you through the stages of construction here. Uh, the excavator in the foreground is one of Fine Turf's excavators and it'll be a similar size that will be used on site, about 14 tonne. It has a shaping bucket on the front which rotates 360, uh, allows the operator great flexibility when creating uh, swales, shaping and, uh, and curves etc. So this is phase one here uh, of a, con a construction of a bunker. So what is happening is obviously the area will be marked out by uh, in conjunction with Ken Moody, uh, the shaper and myself. Uh, the area will then be turf cut or stripped of turf and the excavator will be bring brought in. He will then scrape off the rest of the turf and that will be disposed of uh, in a convenient area. Uh, following on from turf stripping, we then have a uh, uh, stockpiling of topsoil. So what he's doing here is he's stripping off all the topsoil, getting back to a very, very solid base layer. Uh, that topsoil gets stripped and stockpiled and is then used at a later date, which you'll see further on in the slides. So that's what he's doing there, is stripping off the topsoil and stockpiling it. Once the topsoil is stripped off and stockpiled, he then creates a basic shape out of what is left. And here you can see a basic shape going into a bunker on another golf course. 
What you'll notice as well is obviously, as we said before, the uh, excavator has a 360 bucket which tilts no, and no, rotates. Fine. So there he's putting in a drainage channel in the base of the bumper as well. So cutting in the drainage channel which will be then piped and gravelled. Uh, so all of our uh, bunkers that will be going in will be freshly drained uh, so you'll see that happening so there's your basic shape going in and your drainage line Ooh. moving on then the basic shape as you can see is in on this bunker the drainage line is in um, what I want you to pay particular attention to is the turf around the outside edge that is revetting turf similar to the turf used on a Lynx golf course to revet a bunker it has become very much the modern vogue in golf course construction using bunkers uh, in land as well is to certainly revet three or four lines of revetting turf that gives you a very very clean edge to work with uh, and means if there's future damage to the bunker it's just a case of uh, redoing the revetted edge without necessarily having to reconstruct the entire bunker so that's to show you the revetted edge going in And here is a closer look at that revetting turf. So you can see a little bit different to the turf you get at home. Uh, all the turf that we we'll be using on site, so bunker surrounds, bunker liner turf, and revetting turf is all different specifications. So I'll just talk you through that now. This is revetting turf grown on sand predominantly, uh, cut a little bit thicker, uh, so cut quite deep, uh, and then also cut into narrow strips and then palleted. Predominantly go on sand, uh, lower thatch content. Uh, generally takes about three or four years to grow revetting turf and harvest it. So a little bit different to your general day-to-day -day turf, which you can usually get done in a season and lifted. Uh, this matures for a little bit longer. It has a lot more body to it. Uh, and is laid in a brickwork effect that's similar to on the right, similar to what you find on Lynx course. Uh, in our case, we're just using it for the edge. Um, so a lot of inland courses use it for the edge, a lot of heathland golf courses now use it for the edge and that as I said before gives you a clean edge to work to. So predominantly a greens mix in sward, fescue bent, uh, again uh, grown on sand, a little bit thicker uh, and a little bit easier to use as it's cut down. So moving on from revetting turf, this is the next phase you get to, so if you look at the edge uh, the turf edge is in, if you look at the uh, base of the bunker we've got the drainage liners in gravelled, we've also got upside down turf there as a liner, similar to what we'll be using here at panel. And then what you'll notice around the outside edge is all that stockpiled soil, topsoil has been brought back in and the edges have been soiled too, so all that topsoil has been brought back in, it's then been cultipacked, so you've got a lovely area then to lay good quality turf on. So that's the reason for stockpiling the soil, is to bring it back in to use for finishing works when the basic shape is finished. So just putting a little more detail on that, you can see on the bunker on the left there, uh, we have the drainage line in. This time drained to a sump, uh, we're not going to sumps, we have positive outlets, but a similar sort of idea. The liner is in, this liner is in turf side up, we'll be going turf side down, again just personal preference from golf course to golf course, uh, turf side up you uh, would have to spray that off with glyphosate um, to obviously kill off the grass to stop it growing into the sand layer, uh, turf side down the grass layer tends to die off on its own. Uh, liners are an interesting subject, you'll know here at panel we've tried various different liners, we've tried some of the new ones, um, the new ones are quite costly. Um, and do a good job certainly with washout and things. Uh, unfortunately though, the liners aren't 100% um, from what we can see there's still issues with them and one of the issues we have here at panel uh, was the sand drying out with one of the liners that we used uh, causing quite a lot of plug balls. So on this occasion we're going to go back to a tried tested uh, traditional method which is the upside down turf method. Uh, so that's the one we'll be using this time. On the right you can see uh, some drainage pipe Drainage pipe that's used in everyday sports turf from USJ Green Construction through a T, through a bunker, through a sports grounds, uh, plastic coil pipe, 
We buy it in 25 meter coils, but you can get it longer. It's just easier to handle in 25 meter coils. It has these plastic perforations in it, uh, which the water travels through. Uh, over the top of that, we put a two to six mil wash gravel. Important that it's washed, obviously, for particle migration purposes. We don't want the pipe blocking. And the sand spec that we use uh, correlates nicely with our gravel. Uh, so again, is not to block up these pores in the drainage pipe. Uh, so once the shaping is done, uh, the revetted edge is in, the drainage is in, and the line is in, we get to this stage, uh, which is the turfing of the surrounding. You can see the topsoil there has been brought back in, and it's been cultly packed and raked out nicely, and is now just ready for, for that turf. Uh, we're using a turf from Tillers called Arena Gold, uh, which is a little bit of dwarf rye grass in it, and a little fescue, uh, high quality turf, generally grown on a, quite a sandy root zone. Uh, but works very very well we've used it on teas before and it works very very well on bunker surrounds high quality turf from a high quality manufacturer uh, in this illustration here you can see there's a liner in it looks like a rubber crumb liner again we're just grooming it a little bit differently we're going upside down turf but again this is them turfing the bunker surround which is very much the last job uh, prior to the sand going in the bunker And that really is uh, bunker construction uh, in its various phases and that's the phases that we'll be going through over the next few weeks to achieve uh, the desired result and we're looking for a high quality lock and I know that we'll get that by using uh, the contractor that we're using. A uh, picture on the left shows uh, basically a turf farm, Tillers turf farm uh, and you can see there that that's uh, quite industrial mowing, that's mowing on quite a large scale and uh, when you have large turf farms you need to mow on large scales. Uh, and that's uh, some of the, similar to the fields that we'll be getting the turf from. Uh, generally, a very, very high quality product from tillers. Uh, on the right uh, is a similar uh, particle size distribution analysis of a sand that we used uh, in the presentation last time. So, this is a new sand that we're using uh, this time. This was gained from, uh, or the idea was got from another golf club in the area who'd done quite a large scale bunker renovation. Uh, and I thought the sand was some of the best I'd played out of. So we asked what their spec was uh, and we've we've copied that basically. Uh, so this is a little bit more medium fine. We've generally been more medium coarse and that's caused a lot of plugging. So the more medium coarse you are, the faster the drain. Uh, but we just want to hold on to a little bit more moisture if we can to try and keep the sand a little bit firmer uh, to avoid some of that plugging that we've experienced, certainly in our newer bunkers uh, on the fourth hole. So a different type of sand this time uh, to try and achieve a better playability. Uh, so really that was the crux of the bunker construction. I uh, showed you there in detail how we're going to put them together. Uh, seven bunkers across three holes, holes two, four and eight this time uh, and doing some work on the seven uh, through the autumn and winter of this year. So exciting times ahead, very very busy over the next few weeks with that and mulching as well and, and, and seeding tall grass areas, very very busy will be. Uh, so please be patient during that process uh, but the end result should be fabulous. Uh, and we're looking to try and get bunkers in play um, for the April medal. That really just depends on what sort of weather we get and how the turf roots. Uh, it would be a bit mad to play these bunkers prior to the turf rooting. Uh, it would undo a lot of good work. Uh, so we'll see, we'll keep you up to date how that goes uh, and we'll try and make that happen. Moving on from that, the final thing that we discussed at the presentation on Friday was the microdochium. Uh, and it's interesting to know that uh, I asked the audience what they uh, thought microdochium was uh, and not many people knew out there uh, but microdochium is the official name that we use to call uh, the disease uh, fusarium. So first things first, I'm referring to this disease as microdochium patch uh, simply because that's where it is. Fusarium actually is uh, a disease of cereal, not turf grass. Uh, so for years people have obviously called this fusarium or fuzz, uh, but it is actually microdochium patch. They are similar, um, but microdochium patch uh, affects turf. And this is a, a very, very common turf grass disease. And the pictures there, you can see uh, quite a quite a picture that everybody will uh, associate to on the right um, of microdochium patch being quite active. Uh, and on the left, that's a, an extreme example of some of the scarring that can have. 
uh, probably caused that time by uh, pink snow mold which again same pathogen microdocum naval uh, just ex uh, expresses itself in slightly different ways so just a few facts about microdocum patch and we're talking about microdocum patch because this year we saw uh, the greatest outbreak that I've seen of microdocum uh, on turf grass and it is important to talk about it and talk about some of the ways we try to change our methodology of thinking moving forward but firstly microdocium patch is the most common cool season turf grass disease that we experience uh, we do experience things like anthracnose during the summer uh, but microdocium definitely seems to be the one that 95% uh, of the golf courses in the United Kingdom certainly suffer with uh, it's a facultative saprophyte, uh, which simply means uh, it's an organism that lives on another organism. So it, uh, in our case, it lives on turf grass. Uh, all turf grass species are susceptible to some degree, uh, but by far and away, poor annua, uh, annual meadow grass is the most susceptible um, shallow rooting uh, to uh, microdocium patch. Uh, the pathogen is uh, favours damp, cooler conditions, so anything below 16 degrees C, uh, but can live uh, as far down as minus 20 uh, quite happily. Uh, but generally, when it's damper, uh, cooler in the spring and the autumn, uh, we see quite active disease conditions, uh, and those are times of, it, uh, of the year that we have problems with microbial patch in particular. That's not to say that we don't see microdocium through the summer, but generally the difference is in the summer we have grass growth, uh, so the need to use a fungicide is limited because we can generally grow out the disease uh, as fast as it's uh, occurring. Microdocium lives dormant in all golf greens. What we mean is uh, it lives in every golf green in the United Kingdom. Uh, that's not a bad thing, um, but what happens is obviously when the culture is right, that's the only time the disease flares up so it lives there quite happily uh, without any problems and then when the cultural conditions are there when the weather's there uh, so when we go damper when we go cooler uh, when we've maybe got high yen at the end of, uh, of, of the year uh, we start to see that manifesting itself uh, in the disease on the turf grass surface And like any disease, it goes through a life cycle, and this really represents the life cycle of microdocium patch. Uh, top left, uh, you've got sporing on the surface there, very, very difficult to see. Uh, good time to spray a preventive cure to fungicide, uh, but again, you've got to be very, pick it up very, very quickly. Uh, and often these are sprayed uh, when the weather conditions are right. So we may not see active disease, but the weather conditions are right, so there's a preventive fungicide goes down. Uh, top right there, what we see there is something called mycelium. Uh, mycelium looks like uh, looks like candy floss, really. So on your playing golf, certainly in the early morning, you might see this in the autumn, spring. It's like candy floss structures across the surface, and that is disease. That's a disease hyphae spreading out, uh, and that's the disease spreading to other parts of the golf course. You'll notice uh, here at panel uh, the green that's least affected by microbial patch is actually the putting green which from a cultural point of view seems a bit strange because it's one of our more shaded greens so you think it'll be most effective but that just shows how much that microdocium is spread by foot traffic so golfers on golf greens walking through active disease and then spreading it from green to green a lot of our disease as well would start on the collars and approaches like a lot of golf courses we don't have a budget to spray fungicide on collars and approaches it would seem uh, a little OTT uh, so we don't but a lot of that is foot traffic then onto the green and foot traffic from green to green uh, bottom left there you can see microdocium uh, as you would most likely see it on the golf course which is quite active there uh, red around the outside orange red around the outside which shows it's quite active um, in its life cycle and is spreading quite viciously and bottom right is a very very extreme example Again, probably caused by pink snow mold, uh, excessive snow coverage for a lot of days. Pink snow mold is something where if you get excessive co um, snow coverage, you get a humid layer between the snow coverage and the turf grass, uh, and microbial uh, spreads that way. Uh, and when the uh, the snow melt 
uh, sorry when the snow abates what you tend to find is this underneath the surf grass surface so far from ideal situation and you can see there certainly scarring that is dinner plate and sizes very very extreme example there Why then are we talking so heavily about microdochium? Well, obviously, as I said before, microdochium is something we've experienced this autumn quite viciously. Uh, but what's quite worrying for our industry uh, is the chemical restrictions that are now coming into force uh, in our industry. In 2018, we lost two major eradicants. Uh, so generally, uh, fungicides fall into categories of preventative cure eradicant. Uh, curative, you can kind of forget. It's more of a preventive. So really, we have preventive and eradicant. Uh, eradicants used to be the go-to fungicide, so when we saw disease, we sprayed it and it got rid of it as an eradicant. These have been falling by the wayside, uh, as some have been found to be carcinogenic, uh, and legislation has meant that these have now been taken off license. So two major eradicants banned in 2018. The most major of those was Iperidione, which Iperidione was the go-to fungicide in the autumn winter for everybody. And that did a very, very good job of getting rid of uh, active disease. Unfortunately, now that's gone. In 2020, it looks like we're going to use uh, three more major brands are going to be lost. Uh, again, uh, not relicensing them. Uh, so they'll be, they'll be lost forever. So the last eradicant fungicide uh, potentially looks like it'll be going in 2020. We've only really had uh, one released fungicide in the last three years. Uh, and all the fungicides really now experience reduced efficacy. By that we mean they not don't last as long as, uh, as some of the uh, older fungicides used to because they're not quite as potent. Uh, we often see increased cost for fungicide usage simply because it's costing manufacturers a lot to get these licensed and to get them through. Uh, anything with side that means death, uh, which is not necessarily a great thing. Uh, and certainly when we look at like the food chain and um, protection of uh, of people and society, then the more uh, the more we can restrict chemicals, the better really. Uh, so this is increased cost to bring uh, chemicals to market, certain new chemicals. Uh, is this a problem to do with EU? Some would say yes, some would say no. The reality is though, once a chemical is gone, it is gone. Uh, whether we're part of the EU or um, or not, it's likely that that chemical will never come back. And it's simply for the cost of relicensing. It costs the uh, the manufacturers so much to relicense them. It's not really worth doing. Uh, we've got to remember that we form part of the ag market uh, as sports turf in the United Kingdom, but we form less than 1% of the agricultural market. So releasing fungicides just solely for sports turf use is not cost efficient. Uh, and no manufacturer is going to look to do that really. So in the previous slide, we talked about chemical restrictions coming into force and how that's going to shape the nature of our industry in the coming years. We've also talked in this presentation about our adaptivity models and where we adapted it to, to change. And this is another area where we have to adapt to changing times. It goes without saying that fine grass species, agrostis and festuca, deal better with disease than porania. That is a scientific fact. So we have to be looking at converting our greens to fine grass. How do we go about doing that? Well, one way we do that is creating the right cultures, and that is increased airflow and increased sunlight availability. And that's what the, the major basis of our long term tree management program is to increase our airflow and to get better light around our golf greens. Another thing that we have to work at and have to work in hand in hand is better agronomics. So we know that fine, groups, fine grass grows well in sandier soils. We know they're native to the links. So for us, little and often top dressing is paramount. Over the year, we try and evaluate what we did in the, the previous year and what could have gone better. And one of the things that we found was sanding could have gone better. In this part of the world, our sand availability predominantly means that we are medium coarse in our sand makeup. And we certainly found that this year that was very, very difficult to get into the canopy. So we were going days and days after of picking up sand in cylinders. This was blunting cylinders and costing us quite a lot of money in sharpening cost. Another thing we were finding is it was difficult to get sand in with the brush that we had currently. 
So when we look at CapEx investment, we want to make solid cap and CapEx investment that is going to affect the future of our golf club in a positive way. So this year we've brought in grinders so that we can do our own sharpening as and when, which gives us the flexibility to sand as and when we want to. We've also got a better sweep and filter brush, so this allows us to get sand in the canopy a lot better than we were doing prior. So this is where solid capex investment works and where solid capex investment should see us create a better agronomics to create more fine grass. Another thing that we're doing is working with microbiology. So in previous posts I have worked with micro microbiology in the past. So that is living organisms under the ground that fight against disease, that break down organic matter. So this is something we're going to be working at in the future uh, with the use of things like compost tea. So again, big believer that if we're going to go chemical free in the future, we have to look at more natural organic methods of sustaining our golf greens. And certainly microbiology is one of those methodologies. Another thing that we're seeing great research coming out of the United States on is use of plant stress elicitors. So using compounds that aren't chemicals that elicit a response from the plant. So the plant thinks it's under attack and releases its own enzymes to fight off disease. And we're seeing a lot of positive research and in the top right photo there, you can see some of those trial plots in the United States, some of the positive research that is coming out of there by using some of these plant stress elicitors. So these are things that we'll be looking to use in the coming seasons too. As well as doing that, overseeding and interseeding are a massive part of that. So interseeding fescue and bent species into our golf greens. But if we create the culture right, We'll see establishment from these grasses and we'll see them thrive. So when it comes to chemical restrictions and more importantly when it comes to fine grass dominance, that phrase, build it and they will come, is very very true. So creating the cultures is what we are trying to do and solid capex investment is allowing us to do this, to create the cultures that allow us to get better fine grass establishment. So I'd like to thank you for watching this presentation and I certainly hope that you've enjoyed it and that you're filled with a sense of uh, excitement about our upcoming bunker project and we'll keep you up to date how that's going as it's going uh, through posts on social media uh, and our website. Please be patient during this time, uh, obviously it's, uh, it's a time again of massive upheaval where we're trying to do a lot of work on the golf course in a short period of time but always our focus is the betterment of the golf course and you're certainly going to see a better golf course this summer and uh, certainly through increased architecture uh, and what we're looking for is a long-term betterment in our golf course as well when it comes to grass species transition so thank you for watching if you've got any questions, please feel free to direct me them via email or via the office email at the club. Thank you again.